Ah, it's great to see many of our regular viewers back with us again today. We hope you find our discussion equally useful as our previous efforts. Yesterday was the first budget for Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, but providing some welcome continuity in a changing world. As ever, our head of tax, John Endicott, is here to help make sense of it all. I'm Gordon Richardson, and over the next 45 minutes, I'll be asking John what we learned yesterday and where we go from here. Our plan for today's webinar is founded on four E's. Economy. We'll start by looking at the OBR's latest forecast and the bigger picture. Expensing. Tax Director Heather Britton will be joining us shortly to discuss what the new full expensing policy on capital allowances means for businesses. So don't miss that if your business is considering a significant investment in the next few years. Our third E is election. With a general election expected next year, what pre-election giveaways might we get from Chancellor between now and then? Uh, and what might Labour do on tax if elected? And finally, uh, we'll come to the elephant in the room uh, later on. So we'll also talk about pensions and the changes announced yesterday to the annual and lifetime allowances. And as always, John and Heather will be very happy to answer some of your questions. So as always, please do pop those in the Q&A and we will take a look at those a bit later on. So um, John, do you want to um, kick off by taking a look at what we learned yesterday about the economy from the OBR's latest forecasts? Yeah, thanks for that, Gordon. And yeah, so let, we'll, we'll start off with a with a more gentle warm up of running through a few slides that we think are of interest on the the wider kind of economic position. And starting off with um, inflation, good of places I need to start. I mean, there's undoubtedly good news in terms of the way inflation is coming down. Much of that is a is a function of the way the annual inflation calculations work where once you get more than 12 months beyond an item that came into it, it, it drops out and so the rate can move down. Prices are still higher than they were, but the annual rate has moved down. The interesting bit really on the, well, the interesting bit to me uh, on the point here is that the inflation is expected to be higher than it was last November. Um, not massively different, but still, if you look at the slide and you can follow it, we've, we've got two lines here, the yellow lines, the uh, November 22 forecast, and the bluey line is the latest March forecast. Um, as it will come clear a bit later on, the March forecast was actually prepared in early February. So time has moved on a little bit from that as well. But as you'll see, we had last year it been suggested that inflation might turn negative that isn't expected to happen now it is expected to get down to zero uh in a couple of years time let's see if that happens it may not um but i think that gives you an idea similar to where we were before but not quite as optimistic on inflation coming down and let's let's flip on a bit there so where does that take you to some of the other big ones gross domestic product what's the outlook for the economy and this will become more important as we talk about the lack of fiscal headroom for Jeremy Hunt as you look further out. Um, uh, there's, you know, the usual busy graph going on here with several lines. Um, and you can see the, the pretty horrible shape from the pandemic with the V coming down. We're moving beyond that now. We're in the forecast area. And, and this has got you know, the green one was a forecast a year ago. We've got the yellow, which is a forecast in November. And we've got the latest March forecast. And the key point I really want to take, and, and this is consistent across many of these graphs, which are taken from the OBR documents, is that whilst there's a bit of shift in the very short term, actually, the further out you look, it's pretty well, you know, the blue and the yellow line are pretty well in the same place. Um, so there isn't really much that's shifted on any of the economic outlook yesterday. And I think if we then if we then move on from there, what does that mean for government debt? Well, as you can see, you know, there's a lot of lines going on here, but um, they're, they're all still showing a pretty similar position. Things are looking, as you will have heard from the various uh, newspaper and television headlines, things are looking better than they were. We've got, let's call it a windfall, but you know the loss is not as big as the loss was expected to be in the very short term. And Jeremy Hunt has chosen to use that to try and improve the economy and the position short term and to use that to spend on 
you know, the measures that we're going to talk a bit more about today, but also to support defence, to support the energy price guarantee, which in turn helps bring inflation down, and to put some money towards childcare. But even that is quite cautiously being spent and, and taking a while to come through. So, yeah, you know, there's an improvement in the position short term, but you notice the way all those lines are converging as you go further out. And the position is less optimistic as you as you head out there. Where does that take us in terms of, you know, interest rates more generally? Um, uh, there's two graphs going on here, and I'm not trying to just keep you on your toes uh, of trying to follow some of here. So we we've started off by talking about inflation. We've spoken about GDP, you know, the size of the economy. Spoken about the debt position. Really, the big story at the moment continues to be interest rates. And the next few slides just touch on a few points that you know, we think are of interest to look at. Uh, the first one here is just thinking about where the bank base rate is, which is always a kind of you know interesting point to pick up. And this is where you start to get to this uh, slight curiosity about a March forecast that's really a February forecast. And, and the, the purple line is called latest. So we've got green, which is March last year. We've got bluey color, which is the March forecast. We've got purple called latest, and we've got um, the yellow line, which is November last year. Now, the outlook for interest rates and the base rate is far better than it was um, 12 months or so ago, sorry, in this kind of green is September, not March. I was thinking, why is that looking so bad? But it's much better than it was under Liz Truss or, or in all the kind of scary bits last year. Um, but what you're seeing is, and, and they converge down quite a bit, but what you're seeing is that latest purple line has suddenly jumped up even in a month from, so if you look at the bottom on the left-hand side of that graph, that blue line is the forecast unveiled in the budget yesterday, but that was done a month ago. The purple line is one that was done a few days ago. And you can already see the move in a month. And without sounding too much like an accountant and forecasts are only as good as, well, they just forecast at the end of the day. You, you look at the scale of movement in a month and you do have to take all of this with a huge pinch of salt. Mm, um, indeed. I've got a quote here, John, from uh, Richard Hughes, chairman of the OBR, from his presentation yesterday, um, making that point that, as you were saying, that the uh, the forecasts were prepared uh, on the 8th of February. He says markets have remained volatile since then, with interest rates moving both above and below these assumptions in just the last 10 days. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, it, it's, you know, what you're not seeing there, and I think this is probably the, the most important message for people taking on is you're not seeing base rates about to massively drop. You, you know, that we're, we're settling into some kind of new normal. The bit on the right-hand side is more complicated to try and get into, but some of this is starting to measure the impact on government debt. Now, you know, there's 2.5 trillion of government debt. These, the impact of inflation, the impact of interest rates on it is absolutely enormous. And I think, you know, as we move on, probably, you know, we've got we've got a slide that I was starting to talk about, you know, showing someone having a heart attack, even, mm. you, know, you know, however you start to look at it, if, if that's not it's not meant to be tasteless, it's just meant to be, you know, looking at that, the way that 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 red line moves along, you know, and it's looking pretty flat, moving up a bit. And then you see what it's done in 2022 with these sudden peaks coming in with much higher interest payments. And that pain is only carrying on coming through. Um, clearly, getting inflation down is absolutely essential to the index-linked government guilts and reducing down the payments that we've got there. But, you know, the impact of base rates is still significant. Mm -hmm. And for people who can't quite make out everything on that slide, what it's showing is uh, rising government interest payments since 1997. And you can see the huge spike in the last uh, last two years. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of years on the bottom, isn't there? But, it, you know, the, the, the pain is clear coming through. Mm. And I think it's worth, so yesterday's event was, was a fiscal event. So in, in simple economic parlance, 
you know, fiscal is about taxes and government spending. Uh, monetary is about interest rates and the size of the money supply. And yesterday is a fiscal event. And what these slides and the reason for concentrating a bit on the impact of interest rates is, frankly, monetary policy, which isn't under Jeremy Hunt's control, is a much more important point at the moment. Relatively, yesterday's announcement, not that much happened in terms of fiscally and the overall kind of one. It's trying to keep the hand on the tiller. It's trying to keep going forward. You know, the key announcements that we had were, you know, the full expensing that will come on to the, the stuff in pensions, but actually relatively small in economic terms on pensions. The childcare still not that big. You know, the childcare spend still smaller than, let's say, the, the higher public sector pay settlements that would probably be required. A bit more spending on defence, which has been expected. And an extension for three months of the energy price guarantee. Actually, all relatively small beer. You look at the impact of the marketplace, yeah, the, the interest rates on the market. You know, SVB Bank, our corporate finance colleagues are familiar with. This was all kicking off the middle of last week. That The US interest rates head up. They take out the biggest bank failure in the US since 2008 when Washington Mutual went. You know, I would have guessed Lehman Brothers for that one, but Washington Mutual was the, was the previous biggest failure in 2008. Um, so that comes through, Signature Bank goes out, and you look at the contagion knocking on, you look at what's happened to the markets and the big drop in the last few days, and all of that is to do with people trying to decide where interest rates are going to settle. And here's showing you know, the S&P 500, the FTSE 100. It was all looking a bit too good to be true at the start of the year. We were all starting to feel happier, smiles on our faces, thinking things were getting better, and then wallop, it gets worse. And I think if we move on again, Gordon, I'm not trying to get, you know, yep. uh, literally big, closer to home. A big, a big uh, concern for many people. And we were just going to pause here to have a look at what the OBR is saying about the outlook for mortgage rates and house prices. Yes. And, and so, yeah, mortgage rates much, much better than where we were in November last year and what had happened following all of the kind of shock caused around the Liz Trust Premiership time. Um, and that's on the, the left-hand side of the screen, and you can see. But uh, on the right-hand side is the forecast for house prices. We get back, this is only a forecast. But you know, crudely, that's saying that in five years' time, house prices will be about the same as where they are now, with a drop and a recovery in between. Um, we will see how things turn out, but it's all the story of interest rates that's coming through there. Where does this leave us? Well, it moves on to uh, um, thinking about business investment. What we really need is 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 growth coming through. Um, if you're able to flip us on one more, Gordon. Yes. Yeah. This is yeah. one last slide before we get stuck into the, uh, yeah. the actual discussion. And so, yes, what, what's the OBR telling us about the outlook for uh, business investment over the next five years then? Yes. And, and so... You know, clearly, um, Jeremy Hunt has had a limit to where he can spend his money. He's tried to spend it to encourage to get the workforce up, to try and ease inflationary pressures and to have the people there. But the key is to try and build productivity. A key part of that is seen as trying to get greater expenditure. And so we've got a few lines going on here. But the, the yellow line was a forecast in November last year depressingly long term that went up higher than any either of the other two more recent lines so that's suggesting that the outlook has worsened long term for business investment the dotted line is what was going to happen if the chancellor hadn't made his changes yesterday and then the other line we're coming on to the more solid uh, blue one that that zigzags about a bit is the forecast as a result of the policy announcements yesterday and, you know, with that, really, what we need to do is to look at those in more detail because these are key and it's trying to drive growth and to improve the position in the short term. Mm. Well, that brings us on very nicely. Um, and uh, welcome to Heather Britton, who's joined us to talk about yesterday's announcements on uh, full expensing for capital allowances and uh, other changes that will hopefully incentivize businesses to make those investments that the Chancellor is really keen on seeing to help grow the economy in
Thanks, Gordon and John. And firstly, just to say capital allowances, I think, are a topic that's of interest to many of our clients. Um, so these are applicable not only to trading businesses, they're also applicable to people who may be renting commercial property. Um, they're also applicable to people running furnished holiday lets. So in the southwest, these are a big thing for many of our clients. So a capital allowance is effectively tax relief on capital expenditure, for example, plant and equipment, lorries, computers or fixtures and buildings, for example, something like electricity or heating in a, in a building. And what's happened really probably needs to go back two years to explain the announcements yesterday. So the main rate of corporation tax um, is set to rise from this April from 19% to 25%. But this was actually announced two years ago in the budget on the 3rd of March 2021. So back in 2021, it was widely accepted that if they said that the main rate of tax was going to go up by 6%, um, that that would lead to lots of people deferring their investment for two years and waiting to get tax relief um, at a high rate. So what happened, Rishi Sunak introduced um, some super deductions and first year allowances to encourage investment by companies. And these started in April 2021 and they are due to end at 31st of March 2023. So for the last two years, we've had, had a 130% super deduction. And some people might say, well, why 130% tax relief? Well, if you actually take 130% of the current rate of corporation tax, which is 19%, you get to 24.7p in the pound tax relief, effectively 25% tax relief if you invest in new main pool plant and machinery. So that's things like your lorries, your computers and things like that. They've also produced an accelerated 50% first year allowance for some other categories of expenditure. This might be certain fixtures in a property, it might be solar panels, or it might be some long life assets that have an estimated economic life in excess of 25 years. So again, had they not had these, these would take a long time to come through. So last year, there was some consultation and discussions on what would happen from 2023 because the economy hasn't recovered as much as had been hoped. Um, so therefore, what would they do now? The corporation tax rates are going up. So what would come in to help investment? So I've just done the next slide here. And what I've done is I've just looked at five million pounds of expenditure, say on solar panels, but this could be on electrical wiring um, or on other expenditure. So under the current regime, where you get 50% tax relief in year one, and then get 6% writing down every year thereafter. After 10 years, you have tax relief of over 3.5 million of your five million pound spend. So over 70% of your expenditure, you'll have had tax relief against your profits. If you look at had they not changed the rules and just let these first year allowances cease as was originally the case, then we go to the red line and effectively if they'd use their annual investment allowance elsewhere, they'd just get 6% tax relief a year. So we move forward to year 10 um, and we've still got just over 2 million out of 5 million tax relief. So just over 40% tax relief on your expenditure after 10 years. So it takes a lot longer for things to throw, flow through. Hence why there was a lot of pressure on the government to do something yesterday. So here's what they did. So from April 2023, they have introduced what they've called full expensing. This is only for certain types of expenditure. So it's for main pool expenditure. So things that move generally other than cars, but computers, lorries, um, normal chattels in a business, um, as well as certain fixtures. But it's for companies only. But it is for unlimited expenditure. So it's effectively mirroring what we did have for the super deduction, but because the rates has now gone up to 25% for many, they are allowing complete tax relief at 25%, so giving 100%. So it's effectively a like for like relief that is going to continue for three years. We still have the exclusions that we had before, so cars don't qualify, assets which are leased and hired out don't qualify, and it must be new expenditure, not second hand. 
And again, we have the good news that the 50% first year allowances will continue again for another three years. So like the graph I've just shown you, that special rate pool and long life assets, again for companies only, and again, this is unlimited expenditure. So the significant capital expenditure that companies may wish to make, they can now continue to get good tax relief, which previously could have been prohibited had the rules not continued. For those of you not operating through companies, the rules do stay very similar to as they are now. There is an annual investment allowance that's available to most businesses, companies and unincorporated businesses, and there's a £1 million limit. That has now been made permanent um, and they've got rid of a horrible technicality in the rule that could le lead to some difficulties. So for most businesses, they can get 100% tax relief on their special rate pool and main pool equipment in the year of expenditure. If you go over that, then you're left with writing down allowances, which are a lot slower, and they're at 18 or 6%, depending on the type of relief. But don't forget that now we do have some tax relief for buildings. Uh, this was brought in a few years ago, and it does provide a tax relief at 3% on the cost of any new buildings, renovations, or extensions. But different to the capital allowance position for plant and machinery, this does impact on the capital gain when you sell. So if you have a building and claim all of these reliefs, you could end up with a substantial tax charge if you don't go on to reinvest at least the same proceeds. So again, it's considering the life cycle and it's another point that brings forward tax relief that could come back to bite. So just to bring together a few comments, the full expensing and 50% first year allowances have been introduced for three years only. There were some comments yesterday that Jeremy Hunt would like them to be permanent. However, they needed to be temporary. But from looking at the comments from Paul Johnson from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, a lot of this has actually been driven by his own fiscal rules and hands are tied, hence why they are only being brought in for three years temporarily. There is quite an impact on deferred tax. So many companies are now seeing significant balances of deferred tax. This is because assets are receiving tax relief via capital allowances a lot quicker than they're currently being depreciated or written off in their accounts. Therefore, they're getting a lot of tax relief now and the impact of that as it flows through needs to be considered. I've put consider the impact when assets are sold. These super deduction allowances will now go straight to taxable profits when they're sold. So if they are, are sold for some proceeds in a few years time, this could come back to give um, some lumpy profits. And if you don't reinvest in another asset that gets 100% deduction, you could end up with some tax charges unexpectedly. Um, so it's now ever more important than ever to identify any expenditure qualifying for a capital allowance claim. And indeed with cash being king at the moment, and cost of living crisis, there are opportunities here for tax refunds and tax credits to be paid. So please don't underestimate the, uh, the ability to uh, create losses here, potentially carry them back or surrender them for a tax payment from HMRC. So really it's, it's potentially good news for companies um, and it's a good news for businesses spending less than a million, um, but there are, are several opportunities out there for those looking to invest in their businesses going forwards. Thanks very much, Heather. That's really helpful. I'm sure it'll be of interest to many of our viewers. And don't forget, Heather will be joining us again a bit later on to uh, answer any of your questions. So if you've got any questions relating to um, the measures we were just discussing or indeed anything else from looking ahead from yesterday's budget, please do pop those in the Q&A and we'll get around to those a little bit later on. So, um, John, we were going to come on to look at pensions now. Uh, obviously, took a couple of the headline announcements from yesterday concerned um, changes to the lifetime allowance and the annual allowance um, with a view to um, encouraging senior doctors to continue working in the NHS, but also applies across the board to other high earners. So um, let's move on and perhaps you could um, start by just by giving uh, us a recap of how we got to where we are now. Yeah, very, very happy to. So we, we've been keen to, to have a couple of big chunks on what we see as the big announcements for our clients on tax relief, on capital expenditure and pensions, whilst the overall quantum of tax relief 
in overall budget terms on on pension tax relief isn't huge it's a key issue for our clients um looking at so uh, there, there's a number of things to say and this is frankly a, a pretty detailed and hard going kind of area so i thought it helpful probably just to try and recap and i appreciate that some people on this call will be very familiar with some of these things and some others will be thinking this is all a bit mad um so let me just go back and just start with some of the key factors we've got going on one of them is that there is fundamentally two types of pension scheme you can have one is whereby you make a promise to pay someone a pension of a certain level and the employer is underwriting that pension and that's the traditional type of pension for most employers going back uh, going back more than 20 years or so how they tended to be um, and it's still what you generally get in the public sector um, for self-employed people people like me partners in the firm other people we might deal with what you have is defined contribution schemes whereby what you get is the money you pay into it um, and you also get that in certain company schemes you know typical owner managed business companies it's the money going in that comes from it now we had two very different sets of rules historically regarding this and what we had was some brilliant idea called pension simplification uh, i don't think anyone was allowed to call it that any longer in 2006 and somebody decided to invent some rules to cover both of them and this seemed like a great plan um, the reality is it probably wasn't a great plan and it's never really quite worked. And the way they decided to attack it was for defined contribution schemes, what you've historically had is a limit on how much you can pay in. Whereas for defined benefit schemes, you've had a limit on what kind of pension you can get out. So they had two very different sets of rules. When we had pension simplification, we tried to create, or the country tried to create, rules for both and so what we have is an annual allowance of how much you could pay in each year and a lifetime allowance which is how much you could build up in the overall pot and then some funny rules about how that was worked out for final salary schemes um, and when it was introduced what you had was a massive annual allowance so frankly you could pay in more money than you would ever think likely to 215,000 originally and it went up to 255 pretty quickly and, and bear in mind this was labor introducing these ones you know that this wasn't yeah, you know, it was very generous. Um, whereas we had a lifetime allowance, which was much more restrictive. But you know, within within a few years, you could get up to the lifetime allowance if you paid in the maximum. We go on and we start hitting austerity measures, and these limits got cut. And the lifetime allowance has gone sideways, up, down, all about everywhere you want to know every few years, and it's made it impossible pretty much to plan. By 2014, this 215,000 initially as an annual allowance had been hacked down to 40,000. So messed around with all over the place. Then the next function that's relevant to this is that George Osborne comes along and basically wants to unlock the pension schemes and make it much easier for people that already had large pension funds. So the first bit is about people trying to build up pension funds. Here was seen as a big vote winner to make it much easier for those with pension funds already. And so what you would have had before then is you had to take the pensions by age 75. So that gets scrapped. You can leave the pension fund sitting there. You never, ever have to take it as a pension under pension freedom. We also had compulsory annuities. Um, and, you know, if you weren't in drawdown, you had to take an annuity at a certain point. And this was seen as great grossly unfair, particularly with all the problems caused by quantitative easing and fiddling around with interest rates. But bear in mind, the flip side of compulsory annuities was that people got the right to take 25% tax-free cash. What you had was the compulsory annuities went, but the tax-free cash got left untouched. So that was very generous. And then inheritance tax just got taken off the, the pension, so they weren't caught by inheritance tax. So suddenly, you've created this massive family trust planning opportunity that's available to people who are uh, able to get their money in there and you've shifted the whole focus from pensions this then a couple of years later we come back with another attack on the annual allowance so of course what we're now getting to is stopping people being able to put money in and what we have introduced is um, tapering of annual allowances where people's income went above a certain level and this initially tapered down to ten thousand pounds as a minimum and then from 2020 has tapered down to four thousand pounds so very low numbers anyway so other than 
what a ghastly system and how is this really helping anyone? Um, this really absolutely caused problems in the medical profession as the great guru that is Luke Bennett pointed out within days of this being introduced and our firm has been saying throughout, been national experts on all of this going through, these problems were always absolutely there at the start. And the reason why the GPs get particular problems is the GPs are self-employed but they are members of a final salary pension scheme because they're members of the NHS superannuation scheme. That's a deal that was done long ago, but creates particular problems. People can say that it favours, yeah, we can go through all the rights and wrongs as to what it does, but it means that the doctors get absolutely caned for tax charges and it disincentivizes them wanting to work. And that if you're a GP, working half a week looks far better than working a whole week, which is then together with demographic factors led to larger you know, people leaving the workforce as, as GPs and other factors as well. It also completely hammers, I've, I've called them shift-based employees. So uh, hospital doctors are in a different position, but they're no different hospital doctors to every other employee in the country, except that many employees are salaried and get paid a set amount, whatever they do. Whereas if you get down to a point whereby you could take on more work or you might not, broadly what happens with the way a lot of these rules work is that if you take on the more work, you don't actually get any money at all. In fact, you might be out of pocket. So there's a massive disincentive to doing any work. So mm. if we flip on... <clears throat> sorry, Yes, Gordon. I know our, our colleague Kieran Hancock in our specialist healthcare team was writing about this yesterday and uh, he said he'd, he'd already had several inquiries from clients. Uh, within about an hour of yesterday's uh, budget statement. So um, the, he does have a blog on our website for anyone who's interested in finding out more about how this applies specifically to those in the medical profession. But yes, John, let's come on and, and talk about what uh, Jeremy Hunt actually so, announced tomorrow. Uh, yesterday so, so you and how need, it yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to labour those points, but you need to understand where these things are. So these are yesterday's announcements. So what's been odd about our system is that we have both a lifetime restriction and an annual restriction. And frankly, most people have been calling for one of those to go and getting rid of the lifetime allowance seems like a sensible one to pick. And you then just limit the amount that people can pay in. So you basically make them like ISAs. You limit what you can put in each year. You don't restrict the total quantum. And that is where, that's where Jeremy Hunt went yesterday. And what he did was he got rid of the lifetime allowance, just abolished, and he's upped the annual allowance. He's upped the annual allowance and he's made the taper more favourable so that the tapering doesn't start until income gets above 260,000. It tapers back to a minimum of 10,000 rather than the 4,000 we've had in the last few years. And it's only tapering down to £10,000 on those with incomes above 360,000. So it is a lot more generous there. In getting rid of the um, in getting rid of the lifetime allowance, tax-free cash would then have potentially been much higher. And they went, well, we're not going to do that. So tax-free cash has been limited to this figure of 268275, which is 25% of the current lifetime allowance. Now, economically, as I say, these are not big numbers. They do help that they do help with incentives. They do help with some of the workforce there. You can debate the rights and wrongs of them. You can certainly debate whether you just need to up the lifetime allowance or whether you need to abolish it. The overall system's ghastly. I, I think I'd still stick to. Um, overnight, last night and this morning, we've had Labour Party response, which is they don't agree with the abolition of the lifetime allowance. And they've said that um, they would look to reverse that if they were elected and we'll come back on to that a bit more in a moment. Um, now clearly that makes it harder for us to start to advise and to see where things are going, which begins to take us to, you know, where do we go next on this? Well, there's a parliamentary process to go through. The key is, are the Conservatives going to back these measures completely or might we have a lack of unity in the Conservative Party so that we, the elephant in the room, this, this brilliant piece of artwork here to, to give you more things to look at, um, with the, the elephant sitting there with a Tory rosette on. Um, and considering the point, you know, will the Tories back these changes? And further, whilst I get the position that Labour have taken up overnight of saying that they would reverse it, I'm not altogether convinced that that's actually what they would do even if they got elected. Because I think there's, you might be better off just reducing down the tax-free cash 
and uh, restricting the inheritance tax benefits and frankly bringing back the age 75 rule. So I, I, I think you could attack this a number of different ways. Um, Paul Johnson, IFS, tends to pick on some of the particularly favourable elements of pensions and they're all quite complex to attack. Clearly, Labour are going to take up a pretty straightforward position overnight. What I would say for all of our clients is there is dust to settle on this. There's plenty of people already advising. We should get to royal assent by July, let's say June, July. We will know what happens when the parliamentary debates come up. And I would suspect this to be selected by Labour for a committee of the whole House debate, which means it'll be early on in the parliamentary debates on the finance bill. And we'll get a clear idea of government policy and their policy. But I think there could be amendments as it goes through Parliament. OK, thanks, John. It would be certainly be interesting to see how that um, pans out. It's it's already emerged as a, a political dividing line since the announcement yesterday. And we did promise you an elephant in the room and here he is. So we also promised that we'd um, get on to answering some of your questions. Uh, so we're, we're keen to allow time for for that. Um, and you're still very welcome to pose any questions to John and Heather um, in the Q&A box, which is hopefully on your screens. So welcome back, Heather. Um, we got a question here, which I think will be uh, one that you're, you're happy to answer. Um, are there any stamp duty land tax changes to mixed use or multiple dwellings relief following the recent consultation? I have had a number of clients waiting uh, with property transactions with interest so that the current regime works to basically say if you have a residential property, you pay one set of rates which tend to be higher, whereas if you have non-residential property or it's mixed use, for example, it has a commercial element as well as residential, you can pay the generally lower non-residential rates. Um, and also we have a very beneficial regime that if you purchase more than one dwelling or one house in, in one in a transaction or some linked transactions, you can benefit from using the, uh, the lower thresholds more than once. Um, so those rules have been consulted um, because the revenue are aware of some people pushing the, the guidelines too far. Um, however, there weren't any announcements in those two areas yesterday. So it is very much business as usual for stamp duty land tax. And there are still opportunities for those with mixed use properties or multiple dwellings um, to potentially and legitimately save tax on purchase. OK, thanks very much for that, Heather. Another one on the subject of property here. Uh, property income review from OTS, the Office for Tax Simplification, uh, back in November last year. Have we seen any changes in the budget uh, off the back of that? I think thankfully for some of our clients, they had been very concerned um, about some of the rule changes in the budget. I know we have a lot of furnished holiday let clients. Um, and that was one area that was looked at in the Office of Tax Simplification review back on the 1st of November 2022. However, that review did look at the whole of property income for unincorporated businesses and pretty much said there could be change in lots of areas. But one of the areas of change it did discuss was should the special tax rules for furnished holiday lets be abolished or changed? There was no news on that yesterday in the budget. So the rules continue as they are. There was also some conversation as to whether certain levels of property businesses should be able to benefit from certain tax reliefs, for example, incorporation relief um, and business property relief or inheritance tax. And there was talk of maybe a bright line test um, being considered for certain tax reliefs. Again, there is no news on that. So again, it is business as usual in relation to most of property income. The only thing that has happened since that uh, report um, is the fact that there was a call that the making tax digital for landlords um, should be delayed. And thankfully, before the budget, there has already been an announcement that there will be delays to making tax digital for, for property landlords because the system just wasn't ready to implement it yet. Okay, John, do you have anything much. further to add on that? No, I think we'll. I, I think you're, you're doing a grand job of answering the questions here. Brilliant answers. Well, if I can fire one more question at you, Heather, we've had one come in here from David, which relates to what you were discussing earlier. Um, are the only differences only differences between full expensing capital allowances and the AIA that it's unlimited and only open to companies? 
they're not the only differences, um, but they are some of the differences. So the full expense in capital allowances is only available to company. That's correct. It is a limited, again, correct. Um, but for the, uh, the full expense in capital allowances, because they are a first year allowance, albeit they're at 100 percent, they do come under the normal exclusions. So, for example, it can't be uh, an asset that's gifted. It can't be an asset that's leased or hired out. It can't be a car. There are a number of exceptions that can't qualify. Um, whereas the annual investment allowance is £1 million. It's op open to all businesses, including companies, but it does include assets that are leased out um, and it doesn't contain the same exclusions um, as the other one. There are some exclusions, um, but they don't fully go through. Heather, Lovely. there's one other difference so i think probably that is relevant i think here isn't isn't the position uh, you know these things better than me so I, i'll be wary where i go here but isn't the position that um the full expensing it needs to be new exp new assets it, it has whereas to be aia new. you could have second hand or whatever correct yeah, yeah. So, so that you, could be a significant difference for some i suppose couldn't it it could be and things like if you buy something from a developer it is still treated as new expenditure because you're the first user of the property and something like a, an ex demo lorry potentially could still be treated as new. Uh, but effectively, yes, full expensing and 50 percent first year allowances, the expenditure has to be new. OK, thank you, John. Uh, going back to your um, discussion earlier about the pension changes, here's a question for you, I think. Um, so somebody who would be currently caught by the annual allowance taper uh, with an income of approximately 300,000, they want to pay more into their pension. Can they start doing that from April or should they wait a bit? So, uh, I mean, that's a good point. And we were having conversations about this yesterday and queries are already starting to come in. Um, two reasons for waiting a bit, really, at the moment. One is just, I think it would be good to get this on the statute book and with the position to settle and for Labour's position to become a bit clearer. Um, but there's also the point that, with, uh, depending on the nature of the income someone has, if they're self-employed and therefore got uncertain income, or even if they're employed and they've got bonuses and other things that might be coming through, because that will be on a fiscal year basis, some of the problem with this is that you won't know the answer until after the end of the year, but you have to make the pension contributions during the year, which probably means we're going to have to go back to a, or have to approach this a bit a year in arrears and that it would be sensible for someone to think about paying in £10,000 or maybe even a bit more, but not to, not to push their luck too much because otherwise they're still going to get hit by an annual allowance charge. It is fraught with complexity, difficulties, and frankly, it shouldn't have to be this hard for people to save for their retirement. OK, thanks, John. Heather, I said you were off the hook, but we've actually had another question here from Peter, which goes back to the full expensing policy. So if you don't mind, um, what, is, what is your view as to what we can expect for the scope of the full expensing for IT, plant and machinery, as this will no doubt have an impact on many companies' decision making in regard to investment over the coming three years? For example, would refurbishment type works of business shop warehouse premises qualify? Yes, refurbishment work does qualify for capital allowances. I think the first question normally is, is expenditure a repair or is it capital? So something like if you're just giving something a lick of paint, it may just be an ongoing repair or repairing a roof. But if you're doing a big refurbishment project and it's all capital, that's capital expenditure that qualifies for relief. So not only the computer and IT equipment will qualify, but also things like data cabling will also qualify um, for the 100 percent full expensing. It's only things like general wiring, general ele electrics and lighting that then falls in the 50% category. So it's always a case of looking at what that expenditure is for, because sometimes you do have to do an apportionment because there could be some, say, trenches dug for both. Um, but yes, IT equipment and data cabling is in the 100% for companies' expenditure. Thank you. And I think we might have time for one more before we start to wrap up. A uh, question here on the subject of pensions again, John from Lloyd. Um, he asks if someone, perhaps a GP, is drawing their pension already, will they be able to start work again? Obviously, that's the intention of this policy. Uh, and then pay into a new pension utilising the new allowances. 
or will they still be liable to being taxed heavily? Well, um, I, I think the, the short answer to that is going to be it depends and it's complicated. Um, I think some of the factors to bear in mind. So, yes, as you say, the intention is to get them back to work. And the intention is to get them back to work without them being taxed as heavily, because if they're not getting caught by uh, lifetime allowance or, or annual allowance, other charges or more money going in, then that's part of it. It's going to depend upon the type of pension they've got, whether they're draw, you know, how they're drawing down on it, because we've got a money purchase limit that's restrictive coming in as well as it. So um, that's the intention of the policy. It looks like that that's the route that one would want to be dealing with. Clearly for people, yeah, if they might be a GP or something like that, you've got further complications as to which pension schemes they might be within or paying into. So you've got the pension scheme rules as well as the tax rules to consider, but subject to them being able to within the allowances and those being confirmed and the rest of it, it looks like that's a route that they'd want to be exploring and trying to do. But to be honest, we need to see the detail and we need to see this settle down a bit. And we've already mentioned some of our brilliant and clever colleagues who really know what they're doing on this. Um, and and that's the people to refer to and they'll be able to say. OK, thanks, John. And thanks, Heather, for your answers to all those questions. Uh, apologies if we haven't had time to answer your questions. We will try and get back to you offline uh, if we can. So uh, just before we wrap up, we did promise you uh, four E's and our fourth E was election. So uh, just really to look to the future now, um, we mentioned that there's likely to be a, a general election next year, all the smart money seems to be on that, um, although it could technically be early January 2020. 25 i think i'm right in saying so john we looked at the uh what the polls have been telling us last time back in um, november we had one of these webinars really this graph here is uh, showing us that there's not been very much change in recent months still a, a significant lead for the labor party um looking ahead then to the to the next general election what changes might we see uh if there were to be a labor government yeah, I mean, it's um, there, there's a long way to go in terms of seeing what might kind of pan out and happen here and what the government might do later on in, in the year. I mean, I think the key areas that we continue to focus on, uh, capital gains tax, um, uh, as you can see from the yeah, top of the slide there, capital gains tax, the main CGT rate is still at 20%. That looks very generous by the standard of other tax rates. And we continue to see people looking to sell businesses and to take advantage of that or to sell properties and take it, well, sell commercial properties and take advantage of it. We've got a higher tax rate on residential property. Um, that's definitely one to look to still take advantage of. And you would expect that that could head up even if it wasn't Labour winning and the Conservatives could edge it up post an election, but certainly Labour have said they'd move it up. Heather was mentioning STLT reliefs, so for people buying expensive houses and some of the other opportunities there, there are still some ones there. It's been a lot in the press in the last few days, and Dan Needle's been pushing on about carried interest and the, the fact that carried interest is subject to lower capital gains tax rates and not full income tax rates. And one could see, certainly if there was a Labour government, that looks like one that could get attacked. Um, Non-DOM position, uh, plenty of suggestions that there's quite a bit of money on non-DOM and residency that could be curtailed or, or brought down by shortening the period of time be before the non-DOMs achieve deemed domicile in the UK and are subject to full a rising basis as opposed to remittance basis. So these are people who have their main base outside of the UK, but are resident in the UK. Heather's already mentioned things like the OTS report and whether we could see some changes on property income review. So uh, there's a whole host of some things there. I, I thought I'd also pick up on a few things where I think we might see the government and particularly see Jeremy Hunt looking to go if he's looking for some more pre-election measures to try and win some support. Mm. Um, the personal allowance clawback, so this is where you lose your personal allowance for income tax when your income hits 100,000. So between the moment about 100,000 and 125,000, 
it gets clawed back and you end up an effective tax rate of 60 plus percent. And if you've got student loan repayments, you can whack another 9% on that and you get to a, a very evil tax rate. Um, that I could see would be something that politically would be very good to try and come up with a solution on. Um, it was introduced at the end of the last Labour government, but in very different circumstances. And frankly, a lot of the problems of it that have grown have been caused by the, con the both the coalition and then the Conservative administration by upping the annual allow uh, the personal allowance. So that's one I could see they could go for. The higher rate threshold at 50,000, I could see looking to move that, say, to 60,000 or, or slightly higher would be a good aspirational, really key measure that might you know look good and would be harder for Labour to challenge and say, moving up the lifetime allowance on pensions from 1.8 million or to wherever you might want to put it. Um, so that's another one. High income child benefit charge that gets clawed back on the higher earner between or higher income between 50,000 and 60,000. It stayed that way since it was introduced. That would look like one to definitely be trying to benefit quicker. And I thought somewhere where even might have gone in this budget and got to quicker support for childcare than this rather drawn out, it is going to be better for the kind of unborn rather than for people who've already got children at the moment. So I think there's a number of measures there. We'll have to see where, where things go, to be honest. Hmm. Thanks, John. So lots of potential interesting changes to look out for over the next year or so. And I'm sure we'll continue to keep our clients informed um, as and when there's any news on all those fronts. So um, all that remains really is to uh, remind you that there's lots more budget analysis from John, Heather and several of our colleagues on our website. So do head over there if you haven't read their blogs already. Um, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, that's our take on the back to work budget. So on that note, we'll let you get back to work. Thanks for your time. Hope to see you again next time.